Foreign Relations Committee will come to order. Since fighting erupted in Sudan almost a month ago, ceasefires have come and gone with no appreciable reduction in fighting. Violence has left the air in the capital thick with dust and smoke. Food and water shortages have resulted in looting and attacks on civilians by armed groups in search of provisions. The former strongman head of state, who is wanted by the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity, has escaped from prison. The borders are overwhelmed with people trying to escape. Hundreds have been killed, thousands injured, and hundreds of thousands displaced. One American doctor staying to help treat the wounded was surrounded by a group of men and stabbed to death in front of his family. Sudan is not only descending into violent chaos, it is on the brink of a full-scale, zero-sum civil war. And the last civil war went on for more than two decades. So I want to thank our witnesses for joining us today to discuss how we respond to the conflict in Sudan. I welcome the long overdue executive order issued last week with respect to Sudan. And we are all grateful to those who planned and carried out the nighttime rescue operation to evacuate more than 70 people working at our embassy, including Ambassador Godfrey. Thankful, uh, thankfully, all US government personnel escaped unharmed. However, thousands of private American citizens were left to fend for themselves when the violence broke out, to say nothing of millions of Sudanese who now understandably feel abandoned by the international community. I won't sit here and put uh, the blame on the State Department or the administration for a foreign policy failure that has been uh, many years in the making. The failed negotiations on the transition to democracy were supported not only by us, but by the African Union, Gulf states, and the United Nations. Numerous attempts to broker a ceasefire have failed, and the international community has yet to mount a robust humanitarian response. But let's be clear. U.S. policy fell short of the challenge. We refused to call a coup a coup after the Sudanese military takeover in 2021. Instead of imposing sanctions, we put the democratic aspirations of millions of Sudanese in the hands of generals despite evidence of their complicity in and responsibility for gross violations of human rights and significant public corruption. The Sudanese armed forces have a long record of human rights abuses. And the rapid support forces, best known to the world as the Janjaweed, committed genocide in Darfur. And their leader has been implicated in rapes and massacres and has allied himself with the Wagner Group. By convincing ourselves that these figures were going to help Sudan transition to a democracy, we neglected the, the need for accountability. We failed to push hard enough for inclusive civilian participation. And we ended up legitimizing and entrenching those with guns at the expense of the Sudanese people's democratic aspirations. I'd like to hear from our witnesses about US policy options to end the conflict. Our efforts to rally the international community to jumpstart the delivery of humanitarian assistance. And what steps the administration is taking to garner international support for collective action to ensure that military leaders stand down and step aside. I realize sometimes there are no good options, but hope is not a foreign policy strategy. We need to understand how our analysis was so flawed that the State Department failed to draw down its embassy staff or assist American citizens to depart before the violence began. The United States cannot be blindsided like this. I want to understand what is being done to prevent this in the future. Now, I realize that if the views of some ends up being the reality, our ability to predict and prepare for situations like we're seeing in Sudan will be dramatically affected. Uh, because of the potential cuts that, that are being talked about in discretionary domestic spending, well, everything we do at the State Department is domestic discretionary spending. Uh, so I don't know how we're going to get it better with less. Uh, Under Secretary Newland, I'd like to hear a clear articulation of our short, medium, and long-term goals in Sudan and the Horn of Africa, as well as the administration's strategy for achieving them now that we have no diplomatic presence on the ground in Sudan. Ms. Charles, given the emerging humanitarian catastrophe, we need a plan to deliver assistance as quickly as possible to the people of Sudan, to empower civil society voices advocating against all odds and at great personal cost for democracy. Millions of lives in Sudan and the Horn of Africa are at stake, as are our strategic interests in the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea Corridor. We need to put the democratic transition back on track 
in Sudan. And with that, let me turn to the ranking member, Senator Risch, for his opening statement. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would certainly concur in your remarks. I think you're a little kinder than I'm going to be, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we have the situation before us. This is not a happy occasion. It's disappointing we're here today uh, having this hearing. The humanitarian and security catastrophe playing out in Sudan was predictable. This committee has tried to ensure Sudan had the highest levels of attention from the State Department. Sadly, that hasn't happened. Uh, I concur with the chairman that this is not an easy situation. Uh, it's no question that uh, things are difficult there, but we don't have the luxury of just dealing with the easy ones. Uh, more should have been done uh, to protect the Sudanese people from the military junta. We should have done more to warn American citizens and position our diplomatic and humanitarian footprint to respond to the predictable scenario that we all saw unfolding. We have seen this movie before. As Sudan faces a potentially catastrophic civil war and state collapse, like those we've seen in Syria and Libya, urgent leadership by the United States and its allies is required. Certainly the State Department is on the front line of this. No one should be surprised that those involved in the Bashir regime's genocide in Darfur 20 years ago uh, refused to relinquish power. I, I am concerned the United States continues to partner with the same authoritarian actors in the region that have bargained away Sudan's democratic future in order to secure their own interests. Even now, while we hope uh, current of efforts in Saudi Arabia yield a real humanitarian ceasefire, but we must also be very honest with ourselves about the motivations of some of the regional actors. In the four years since Sudan's generals removed dictator Omar al-Bashar from power, a naive hope toward corrupt military leaders and their foreign backers has driven U.S. policy in Sudan. This approach has, has empowered Sudan's strong men while victimizing the Sudanese people and undermining the country's democratic future. The Biden administration has sanctioned only one Sudanese entity under global magnitsky. While President Biden issued an executive order last week, there were no designations with the announcement. Very disappointing. The U.S. has also not put its best diplomatic foot forward to deal with the problem. We did not name an ambassador to Sudan, to Sudan for uh, more than two years after normalizing relations during a critical time in Sudan's transition. The U.S. Embassy in Khartoum has also faced persistent understaffing and leadership challenges. Congress has spoken in a bipartisan manner with an unmistakable voice on Sudan throughout the post-Bashur transition. But the Sudanese pe put the Sudanese people first and end the stranglehold of Sudan's security forces on the country. This administration, however, doesn't seem to be listening. <coughs> During our last Sudan hearing 15 months ago, I called for the administration to articulate a clear vision for what it wants in Sudan. I'm still waiting. The administration uh, must change not only the architecture, but also the architects of this policy. We need a policy that empowers the Sudanese people, weakens these generals, shuts off the foreign meddling and finance that empowers them, and leads a coalition of partners committed to putting Sudan's democratic future first. We must end this cycle of doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, just as the chairman indicated, about how the administration plans to meet immediate needs in Sudan and make an urgent course correction in its Sudan policy. Before I close, I'd be remiss and I want to express my deep disappointment for your failure to respond to mine and many of my colleagues' questions for the record in a timely manner. You last testified before this committee on January 26th. Then, after that hearing, as is usual, questions for the record were submitted because we have limited times at the hearings. That was over 100 days ago. I received answers to those uh, questions for the record. Do you know when? The delay in responding uh, to these questions underscores serious doubts in my mind that the State Department puts any value on communication with Congress and holds no respect for this committee's oversight role. Some of the questions I submitted to you were about uh, Sudan. And now we get an answer over 100 days later and uh, the day before the next hearing on this subject. I really feel that uh, this demonstrates uh, that, uh, it, that the department is just going through the motions to mollify this committee and uh, continue on its happy way keeping us in the dark. I expect to receive meaningful explanation 
of why these questions for the record took play it took over 100 uh, days to complete thank you mr Chair. thank you very much senator Rich. our witnesses today are ambassador victoria newland under secretary of state for political affairs Ms. Sarah Charles, Assistant to the Administrative USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Under Secretary Newland has a distinguished 33-year career as a diplomat, rejoining the department as Under Secretary for Political Affairs in April of 2021. Um, and I won't go through all of that history, but uh, so that's suffice it to say that's a, an incredible career. Sarah Charles is Assistant to the Administrator USAID in charge of the Bureau for Humanitarian Affairs the U.S. government's lead for international disaster response. Before joining the Bureau, she was Senior Director for Policy and Advocacy for the International Rescue Committee and has worked with the National Security Council as Director of Humanitarian Affairs. We thank you both for your participation and your service to our country. Uh, I'd ask you to summarize your statements in about five minutes. Your full statements will be included in the record without objection. Ambassador Newland, we'll start with you. Thank you, Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, distinguished members of this committee. We appreciate the opportunity to be with you and exchange views at such a difficult and consequential moment for Sudan. The third largest nation on the African continent, Sudan, holds enormous promise and opportunity. It should be a thriving breadbasket for its people, the region, and the world, but instead it has been plagued as you both noted, by decades of authoritarianism, economic turmoil, and civil war. In 2019, the Sudanese people, longing for a different future, led a peaceful protest movement that ended the 30-year reign of a dictator, only to endure a military takeover two years later. Our engagement since has focused on restoring the promise of that 2019 revolution and supporting a civilian-led transition to democracy and civilian rule. We've worked over the past 18 months to, with civilian partners in Sudan to build a coalition to lead this effort while simultaneously putting pressure on Sudan's generals to engage seriously in a political process. Despite the courageous effort by Sudanese civilian leaders and intensive engagement by international actors, which did yield considerable progress since last fall on elements of their own framework for a political agreement, those negotiations, as you know, broke down over the unwillingness of the two military leaders to resolve the last issue which stood in the way of a return to democracy namely how the rapid support forces and the Sudanese armed forces would integrate under a unified command structure. On April 15th, we saw months of progress erased overnight. You've seen the images, hundreds of killed in pillaging, looting, armed conflict across the city, food, water, medicine, electricity, telecoms cut off, hundreds of thousands of families displaced or hiding in their homes. Our first priority, as you noted, was the safety of our people. Over seven days, we consolidated all U.S. personnel at the embassy compound, where our military then bravely extracted them by helicopter on April 23rd to Ethiopia and onward to Djibouti. Then, with the help of partners, British, French, Germans, and Saudis, we organized three overland convoys from Khartoum to Port Sudan, transporting more than 700 more people and hundreds of our own people uh, also boarded allied and partner flights. In total, we facilitated the departure of 2,000 people, including 1,300 U.S. citizens and family members, along with U.S. LPRs, locally employed staff, and nationals from other allied and partner countries. From the outside, outset, we have also worked to silence the guns Secretary Blinken, Assistant Secretary Molly Fee, our ambassador to Sudan, Anthony Godfrey, and teams across the department have been tirelessly engaged. Uh, first, with Secretary Blinken's intense personal effort, we have secured six sequential short-term ceasefires, which have lessened the fighting and allowed these evacuations and some initial movement of humanitarian aid. And then, working intensively with Saudi Arabia and other partners, we began on Sunday these pre-negotiations with the warring parties. To date, the Secretary has made seven separate calls to Generals Burhan and Hamedi, 
to try to silence the guns, jumpstart this emergency diplomacy, and get talks going. He's also been in touch with African Union Chairperson Faki and leaders across the region and in Europe. And as you know, uh, for the last three days, uh, starting on Sunday evening, Assistant Secretary Fee and Ambassador Godfrey have led the U.S. delegation uh, to these emergency uh, pre-negotiations that began in Jeddah. Our goal for these talks has been very narrowly focused. First, securing agreement on a declaration of humanitarian principles, and then getting a ceasefire that is long enough to facilitate the steady delivery of badly needed services. Uh, if this stage is successful, and I talked to our negotiators this morning who are cautiously optimistic, it would then enable expanded talks with additional local, regional, and international stakeholders towards a permanent cessation of hostilities and then a return to civilian-led rule as the Sudanese people have demanded for years. We and our partners continue to make clear to the warring parties, led by these two generals, that there can be no military solution to this crisis and negotiations are the only way forward. We've also made clear, as you said, Chairman Thru and Ranking Member, through uh, President Biden's May 4th executive order to authorize future sanctions that we will hold those responsible for stealing Sudan's future to account. These new authorities reinforce a consistent message from the U.S. that the world is watching, the fighting has to stop, and we'll hold those responsible to account. Meanwhile, we appreciate Saudi Arabia's role hosting these talks, and we will continue to work closely with all regional partners, including the African Union, IGAD, the Sudan Quad, that includes the UK, uh, to bring this conflict to an end. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, and Mr. Ranking Member, in this context, uh, thank you for passing our ambassador to the African, ambassador designate Stephanie Sullivan for the African Union through this committee and urge your support and help getting her confirmed on the floor. Uh, <coughs> despite the many setbacks, we will continue to stand with the Sudanese people in their demands for a peaceful and democratic future. They deserve better. I thank you, look forward to listening to your questions and Ranking Member Rish, you are absolutely right. Those questions should not have taken 100 days. It is on me, it will not happen again. I apologize. Ms. Charles. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Rish, distinguished mem Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Rish, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify, testify before you today about the unfolding humanitarian crisis in Sudan and the U.S. government's response. It has been less than one month since the hostilities between the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces erupted, but the impact on the people of Sudan has already been devastating. Ongoing violence has led to the death of hundreds, injuries to thousands, and destruction of critical infrastructure and disruption of basic services. Attacks against humanitarian staff and the looting of humanitarian assets force many of our partners to temporarily suspend hundreds of life-saving programs and relocate their staff, impacting millions of people who relied on these programs to meet basic needs. Before the conflict, almost 16 million people in Sudan, more than one-third of the population, required humanitarian assistance. We do not yet know the full extent to which humanitarian conditions have worsened since April 15, but their early reports are grim. An estimated 70% of hospitals across conflict-affected areas are not operational. More than 3 million women and girls are at risk of gender-based violence. More than 19 million people in our latest anal analysis could be food insecure in the next three to six months if fighting continues. More than 700,000 people have been internally displaced and more than 170,000 people have crossed into neighboring countries, meaning that the ramifications of this conflict do not end at Sudan's borders. They stretch into the region, compounding existing humanitarian needs across several countries. The United States is the largest donor of humanitarian assistance to Sudan, and while the operating context has changed, our commitment to providing assistance to the people of Sudan has not. On April 23rd, USAID Administrator Samantha Power announced the deployment of a Disaster Assistance Response Team, or a DART, to the region to lead and coordinate the U.S. government's humanitarian response. While some of our humanitarian programs are temporarily suspended, as of yesterday, 19 of our longstanding partners with strong national networks continue to operate 
albeit with limited capacity and dwindling pre-positioned supplies. Since the beginning of the conflict, national staff, neighborhood committees, and other civil society organizations have shown tremendous bravery, responding to the needs in their communities amid incredible risk and uncertainty. One of our partners has been dispatching a network of midwives across Khartoum to manage obstetric emergencies and support home births amid airstrikes, gunfire, and rubble, when it's been too dangerous for pregnant women to travel to any of the few operational hospitals. Their bravery and commitment to the Sudanese people has helped save lives and bring new life into the world in otherwise grim circumstances. Despite incremental progress, the insecure operating environment, lack of access, limited supply levels, inaccessibility of cash, unreliable electricity and telecoms will impair their ability to sustain this limited delivery of assistance in the coming weeks. Looking forward, we're working closely with our partners to respond now, even as we assess additional humanitarian needs. While rapid assessments are ongoing, we are working with partners now to use existing programs and pre-positioned stocks to scale up and pivot emergency programming where conditions allow. We're also working closely with our colleagues at the Department of State and the United Nations to advocate in JEDA and elsewhere for the conditions that will allow for the scaling up of humanitarian operations, including overland routes and air bridges from neighboring countries. We're also asking government entities in Sudan and in neighboring countries to decrease bureaucratic barriers that limit relief organizations' ability to respond to the crisis at scale. For example, by expediting customs procedures, issuing visa waivers for aid workers, and waiving requirements issued by the Sudanese Humanitarian Aid Commission, or HAC, to fast track humanitarian activities. For many years, the HAC has chronically hampered humanitarian action and delayed life saving assistance in Sudan. These restrictions were egregious before, all the more so now. Amid ongoing attacks on aid workers and assets, including the one that um, Chairman Menendez just mentioned, we remain focused on the safety and security of our humanitarian partners. To date, fighting has resulted in the tragic death of at least six USAID partner staff and injuries to others. In conclusion, this conflict is the culmination of decades of impunity for crimes committed across Sudan. Impunity that has affected our own staff when the murderer of USAID employees John Granville and Abdul Rahman Abbas Rahama, who were killed in Khartoum in 2008, was released from prison in January. The Sudanese people have been demanding an end to injustice and impunity for decades, and we stand with them. The humanitarian crisis in Sudan will continue to deteriorate if humanitarian access and the delivery of assistance to millions of vulnerable people continue to be limited by the ongoing conflict and the actions of the parties. By seeking a resolution to the conflict and commitments from the parties involved to uphold humanitarian principles, we can scale up life-saving programs across Sudan. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you both for your testimony. We'll start a, a series of five-minute uh, rounds. Uh, Madam Secretary, let me preface what I'm about to say. I'm saying you got a big portfolio umbrella. Uh, some of the issues that we're going to be discussing here are more specific to your colleague, who is the Assistant Secretary for African Affairs. Um, and I get it, but since you're the representative of the State Department here, uh, take my questions in that spirit. Uh, so there have been uh, published reports that are highly critical of the administration of Sudan policy. Among the things that it says is that there was uh, memos written and circulated within the State Department's Bureau of African Affairs warning of US uh, risk of current US policy in Sudan and listing potential scenarios that could emerge uh, in the rivalry between Buhan and Hermedi, including full-scale conflict. They were heavily redacted, never got to the secretary's desk. Uh, it has been noted that Buhan and Hermedi were amassing forces around Khartoum uh, and that at lower levels, uh, statements were being made about that as a reality of a real challenge to the possibility of conflict breaking out. There is talks about from a several dozen, uh, both officials and advocates, uh, Sudanese activists, who describe a deeply flawed U.S. policy process on brokering talks in Sudan in the run-up to the conflict 
monopolized by a select few officials who shut the rest of the interagency team out of deliberations uh, and quieted a chorus dissent uh, over the direction of U.S.-Sudan policy. Uh, it goes on to say, from the outset, there is a consistent and willful dismissal of views that questioned whether UN talks would be a recipe for success or for failure. Those warnings were ignored, and instead the U.S. built a, quote, I'm quoting now, a dream palace of a political process that has now crashed down on the people of Sudan. Uh, I have noted on several occasions that uh, Assistant Secretary of State Fee seems to be have aversions to sanctions as any tool at any time for any purpose. That's a problem because I don't know how else you induce, especially uh, two entities, two individuals like this, to act when you have, I don't know what you have to offer uh, at the end of the day or what consequence they face. Uh, and lastly, uh, civil society seems to be cut out and disillusioned activists have lost faith in the, Uni faith in the United States. That's all bad news none of which is responded to in any of the testimony that we've heard here today. So can you take um, uh, a minute or so to talk to me about all of that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me start by saying that when the, when the uh, leader Hamdok was thrown out uh, we, in October of 21, uh, we did institute harsh penalties against Sudan, which were controversial internally given how strong they were. If you recall, after that um, move, the, we designated the Central Reserve Police. Uh, we also suspended all bilateral aid and debt relief and iffy support uh, there were questions internally whether that was the right thing to do because, of course, some of that has implications uh, for the Sudanese people. But the goal of those moves, which were made on this secretary's watch and this administration's watch, were to shock the parties into getting serious about a broad framework for transition. Thereafter, we supported the Sudanese own framework that emerged, which was led largely by the civilians. Now you could ask the question whether there was a broad enough community of civilians involved, but this was a process designed by the Sudanese themselves, and steadily used pressure on the generals and the parties to try to work through all of the issues getting back to a transition. As I said to you, yes, uh, we saw the generals keeping their own options open. They did not put all of their forces into garrison. Um, um, however, that structure did work through many of the issues preparatory to a return to civilian rule. We were left with one issue, which was whether these two generals would integrate their forces because you can't have one more, more than one army in a country at a time. There was um, incredible effort made, including by the secretary himself, to offer options for the two of them for how these forces could be integrated various different ways, not just by us, but by the African Union, by our partners. And then, but as I said, Unfortunately, they chose the path of war, not the path of integration. At various points during these talks, since October and onward, um, we have seen tensions spike between these two generals. At every previous point, with our partners, with the Sudanese civilians, we were able to tamp things down and get them back to the table. That was not successful on April 15th. Um, that said, throughout this period, we had been warning American citizens not to travel to Sudan. We had been strength strengthening our own internal procedures should things get violent again. Um, look, it is a tragedy yet again. Can we get them this process restarted? We'll see. Will it be the same process? No, it'll have to be broader, but that's where we are. Yeah, well, look, uh, I'm going to close by simply saying it seems to me that we need to have a process. 
uh, that, that number one, uses our intelligence and, and the Bureau at the State Department is pretty good. They've been uh, on the mark sometimes better than some of our other intelligence agencies. And we need to red tag or red team, however you might refer it, some of our presu presumptions. Because you can't work on there everything that's going to be the rosiest thing uh, and then hope that it will turn out that way, you know, buttressed by some hard work. But nonetheless, you have to have other, uh, uh, other availabilities uh, to think through what is the process of consequences that, that it doesn't work out as you aspire for it to. And so uh, I am deeply concerned that uh, we do that on more than one occasion and we find ourselves with the consequences of not doing so. I think that's incredibly important for the department to internalize uh, and, and to think about um, because I, 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 I'm deeply concerned about the information that exists. I know that I used to deal with Senator Coons as he was trying to uh, find a pathway forward and I was insisting on taking care of the victims of um, terrorism. Uh, sanctions ended up proving the ability to get us there uh, in the right way, uh, but you know, uh, I, uh, but but for it, I, I don't think that we would have taken care of those victims. Senator Risch. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Secretary, I, I, I know you think that uh, the chairman's statement, some of them were kind of harsh, but I can I can assure you that uh, there's worse stuff out there than that. You've probably read uh, yourself and. Uh, and let me say, I, I, I do understand, I think everybody understands, this is a very, very difficult situation. But I think it needs uh, more attention than, uh, than what it's getting. This morning, uh, Foreign Policy uh, published an article called How the U.S. Fumbled Sudan's Hopes for Democracy, uh, written by Robbie Grammer. Have you had a chance to review that? I have, Ranking Member. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, submit that for the record, please. I, I think it's a good... Uh, discussion of, of the issues and the problems and, and how we got here. I, I, to be honest with you, I, um, I don't see how we move forward with the, with the current situation the way it is in Sudan with two, two warring generals. Now, most people agree that it's not a full-blown civil war at this point, but uh, I, I, you know, history tells us what's going to happen, and that is it's going to move towards a full-blown civil war. And of course, that country's in, uh, in difficult uh, enough straits. So, uh, let me let me ask this. And and first of all, I the the Africa uh, portfolio is a, is a tough portfolio. There's no question about that. And there's all kinds of stuff that's got to be done. As you know, I've got staff that's focused on that, and uh, they they try to work with you uh, as as much as you'll permit. Um, but uh, this is an area that uh, that we have been focused on for some time. And, and it's just not working. And so I guess the, the question I'd have for you is, have you got, give me some hope here. I mean, I, I think uh, sitting down with the two generals again, uh, as we've done a number of times, that, what, you know, we all look back to the time when our envoy sat down with them and they promised nothing was gonna happen on the airplane on the way back, they found out that they, they were conducting the coup. So um, th this just, it seems to me that uh, we've got to do things different than, than what we're doing. So give me some hope here. What, what are your thoughts about uh, a bigger uh, movement outside the box than what we're talking about, sitting down again and saying, will you guys be good guys? Oh, yeah, we'll be good guys, and then, and, and then uh, away we go. Give me some hope. Well, thank you, Ranking Member. First of all, we can't get anything done in Sudan. We can't even restore a process in which civilians are participating until the violence stops and we get some aid in. So that's why these Jetta Fair talks enough. are narrowly scoped, right? And you have to work with the guys with the guns. Um, the fact that both of them sent delegations, that was not easy to get done either and were, as I said, cautiously optimistic that this first installment on getting humanitarian support in um, will allow us to get going in coming days then the ceasefire has to be more durable. We have the sanctions tool now that can allow us to continue to pressure them. Frankly, um, we agree that we're going to have to have a broader process. It's going to have to include more Sudanese voices, but when you have a population that is either largely displaced or hiding in their houses, we're going to have to get to enough peace to, to do that. Uh, the Sudanese people are the bravest and strongest voices in this. They don't want to live this way any further. And uh, I would say that under Ambassador Godfrey and 
with the support of Assistant Secretary Fee, we have far broader connectivity and connection with voices throughout society who need to be part of this. And even from the talks in Jeddah, Ambassador Godfrey is staying in contact with Sudanese civilians about how we would move forward, make this tent bigger, support them with international uh, uh, assistance as well as carrots and sticks, um, if we can get there. I want to just go back, if I may, um, Chairman, to something you said about the Africa Bureau. I, you know, I oversee the Africa Bureau. I take responsibility for this as well for Secretary Blinken. Uh, this Sudan policy has been very difficult. I would say that the debate within the Bureau, the debate within the building, the debate within the interagency, uh, which I've participated in many times, has been robust and difficult. Um, we have never taken any options off the table, but we were, as I said, uh, believing that this framework that the Sudanese themselves put forward was making progress and we had the sanctions at the ready if it wasn't and then we had this choice by the general so uh, I just want you to know that this is a secretary who supports rigorous debate inside the building and I support that as well and frankly we've had it all the way through this crisis so let me just underscore that and we will continue to um, as you know, he cares deeply about this one and is regularly bringing people up to hear different views, including through the dissent channel. Um, Secretary, uh, ha you yourself and the, and the chairman underscored, and I did too, uh, about all the problems in Africa and the, and the difficulty there. Ha has any consideration been given to uh, getting an envoy or somebody who is specifically focused on uh, on Sudan, um, we had that before. That we, we all know that the uh, ambassador was out of the country when uh, when the last uh, blow up happened. It just seems to me it needs more attention, more individual attention, because as you've noted, you got a whole lot on your plate, and so do the other people that are working in the uh, at, at the Africa desk. What what are your thoughts on that? So we're obviously looking at all the options as things move forward, but. Uh, Ambassador Godfrey is s central to all of this, so until we can get him back into Sudan, he will continue to work both on the Sudan internal conversations, and as I said, he is in contact with a broad cross-section of folks on the ground, but he is also likely to play a stronger role in some of the regional diplomacy and global diplomacy that we need on, on Sudan. So that is how we are thinking about it at the moment. As you know, our uh, envoy for, um, for the Horn, uh, Ambassador Hammer, has been focused primarily on Ethiopia and the GERD, but he will also play a reinforcing role as necessary on this, which is within his mandate. Yeah. Well, thank you. My time's up. Uh, I'm going to have some more questions uh, for the record. I hope that I don't have to wait till the uh, till the leaves turn to get an answer on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. I, uh, just a comment. You know, you mentioned civil society. Civil society doesn't feel like they're in this. As a matter of fact, they feel that the two generals have dictated that they have to be out in order for them to talk. That, that's fundamentally wrong. Senator Cardin. Well, first, let me thank you for your, for your service. I want to follow up first on Senator Risch's point about our capacity here. Uh, the cartoon mission has always been characterized as, as historically difficult to staff. So one of the challenges that we've had is do we have adequate, did we have adequate personnel in our, uh, in our missions in order to deal with these challenges? Uh, that's an issue I want to talk about generally, not necessarily today, but we really do need to figure out how we can staff these challenging missions with uh, adequate resources to have the attention we need to avoid conflicts. I want to talk about the Americans that still are in uh, Sudan. Uh, we're, we understand that we were able to get those who serve in our mission safely out of Sudan. There are many other Americans that are in Sudan today. Do we have an estimate of the numbers, particularly those that are interested in uh, leaving Sudan? Uh, the circumstances there are certainly anything but certain as to what's going to happen as far as safety. Uh, what is our game plan on helping Americans? 
Uh, Senator Cardin, when the conflict began on April 15th, we had connectivity with about 5,000 Americans who had registered with us in one form or another. That enabled us to push out messages, I think, 12 times so far uh, about various options for leaving the country, uh, traveling on flights with allies, or this overland convoy. That's what resulted in our being able to get about 1,300 of them out. Um, we are in contact with a number of them who are continuing to weigh their options. But as we have Americans who are more ready now than they were at the time that we were doing these overland convoys to get out, we're giving them advice on various ways that they can do that, routes that are considered more safe. Uh, were we to have a critical mass, a, a, a larger number that wanted to come out, we would look again at other, at other options. But at the moment, our sense is that the Majority of the Americans who have stayed in Sudan have stayed for either reasons of family or work or history, but we are in contact with uh, a large number of them still. Do we have an estimate as to how many Americans are interested in leaving Sudan that are there today? When I asked this question of our consular folk yesterday, uh, they felt quite comfortable that as we are getting, frankly, in small handfuls, people making a decision now to come out who didn't want to come out when a week or two ago we are able to accommodate them on transit. Um, but that situation changes every day as people evaluate their personal situation and we'll stay in touch. And the notifications that you're talking about, could you just explain what notifications were given to Americans, um, I guess, uh, after April 15th? So as I said, um, first of all, just to lay the predicate that the travel guidance to Americans has been since October 21 that they should not travel to Sudan. If they do travel to Sudan, that they should register with the embassy. We had about 5,000 Americans uh, registered with the embassy, as I said. That enabled us in a much more um, modern and efficient way to send over 12 messages to them in the last two weeks, offering them various options. We use text, we use WhatsApp, we use email, uh, we use the contact information that they give us. The um, registration form that we are now using uh, asks for multiple ways to contact, including family at home, which has allowed us to be um, more complete this time than, than we might have been in the past. It sounds like you are, have some confidence that we can get information to those who want to leave Sudan as to the opportunities that are available uh, on different options that you're, you're in, in contact. Is that fair to say? That's absolutely right. And, and frankly, we invite any of you who are hearing from constituents, et cetera, about people who we haven't captured by our system, please come and send them our way. And how confident, let me ask this, I might too, to Mr. Charles, how confident are you about us being able to get humanitarian assistance into Sudan? You mentioned about the midwives, but are, do we have a network that's reliable to try to get help in? Currently 19 of our 33 pre-existing humanitarian partners are operational in some capacity, although at a much more limited capacity than they were. We have a lot of supplies that are flowing into Port Sudan right now, including more than 30,000 metric tons of U.S. sourced in-kind commodities that are in the, uh, uh, anchored in the Suez right now. And one of the key elements of those talks in Jeddah right now is the kind of security arrangements that would allow those supplies to come in and come in at scale and be distributed in a way that is more reliable. But even right now, we've worked with our partners, authorized our partners to use pre-existing stocks in country to respond where they can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Ricketts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Ambassador, for being here. I want to talk about the Americans that were in Sudan as well. Help me understand, because it seems to me that once again the Biden administration was caught flat-footed by the events that were developing, similar to Afghanistan, that this changed in a way that you did not anticipate. And what were the steps that you were taking, or what plans you had placed to be able to help Americans? So if I understand correctly, the fighting started on April 15th. You evacuated our embassy on the 22nd. 
but the overland route didn't start until April 28th or 29th in that area. And so tell me, help me, because Britain evacuated 1,573 people by air, France and Germany over 1,700 people by air, yet initially we were told that the security situation made it so that it was too dangerous to be able to evacuate Americans while other nations were evacuating their people. And then days later, you're organizing a ground convoy instead of an air convoy. Did you not do contingency planning with regard to this? Why did it take so long to be able to start evacuating Americans out? Thank you, Senator Ricketts, and good to see you as a, uh, on this committee. Um, let me break it down in time and space. So, as I said, f first of all, uh, we had in place a broad warden system that ca and captured about 5,000 Americans, so we were able to push messages to them. We initially, for those Americans who could get to the airport, because one of the reasons that we did our first embassy, our embassy evacuation at the embassy grounds was in those days between the U.S. evacuation of, by helicopter and our allies beginning to fly into the airport, the airport was too dangerous. So by the time the airport was more safe, and I can talk to you in another setting about how that was enabled um, with U.S. support and help, uh, we were able to put Americans who could get to the airport on allied flights. So. Uh, UK, Germans, others began taking Americans who could get to the airport, but a number of them still could not do that, uh, which is why we determined that uh, arranging an alternate route over land would provide another option not only for our citizens uh, but for other countries. So as our allies began flying, enabled by us, I will say, we also provided this second route for those who couldn't get to the airport. So 700 over land by the land convoy, but in total 1,300 Americans, some of them who took the Allied flights, some of them who took our land route. So what I hear you saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the news reports saying that while other nations like France, Britain, Germany were able to evacuate their citizens by air, the United States had coordinated with them to evacuate people by air, and we were going to take the overland route and would take their citizens. It was, so the media was really misstating what was going on, that we had a plan here where they were going to do the air, we were going to do the overland. Because the, the reports I read made it seem like the United States had no plan to evacuate people by air, and that we did this overland route that happened, you know, on April 28th or 29th, much, you know, almost two weeks after the fighting started. So is, is, is that accurate that you, you were actually, the media got it all wrong and what's going on here is America did, took the overland route and the other allies took Americans out through the air route. Is that what you're saying is what happened? Yeah, it was a division of labor, if I may say, after when, when the airport first opened where allies were doing the flying, Americans were going on those flights if they could get to the airport, and, and we were doing Americans, the land route and how, both we and allies were getting And how about, how about how many Air Americans went out on the flights? So if you do the math, if we got 1,300 Americans out and 700 were by, I don't know how many, was it, more Americans got out on Allied flights, I think, than got out on the land route because the math would lead to that. So probably 700 Americans got out on Allied flights, and we're grateful to them for that. Did you, now, was this a plan in place that you had prior to April 15th, working with uh, the Allied nations? Had you done contingency planning that if the general started fighting, Here's what we were going to do to evacuate Americans. Uh, we do continual uh, planning with our allies and partners, largely based at our military commands, and, and we can do a classified briefing for you if that would be helpful for all high threat posts and various contingencies. Uh, with regard to this decision on the division of labor, it had to do with um, various uh, concerns about uh, who was best positioned to do what at the time, and it was negotiated and arranged in real time at AFRICOM in Djibouti as well as in AFRICOM in, St in Stuttgart with our allies. 
Okay. Thank you, Ambassador. Mr. Chairman, thanks. Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Menendez and uh, Ranking Member Rishan. Thank you for the full committee's attention um, to this uh, difficult, um, urgent challenge. Uh, Under Secretary Nolan, Assistant to the Administrator Charles, thank you for your testimony and your focus on this. Uh, a vast country the size of Alaska with 45 million people um, that is um, teetering on the brink of an all-out civil war. Um, we could be on the verge of a dramatic, large-scale humanitarian crisis, uh, or we could, depending on the outcome of these um, tense preliminary negotiations in Jeddah, see a turning back towards some hope for stability. Um, as you know, I worked hard with other members of this committee. Um, Senator Van Hollen and I went to Khartoum uh, to meet with the then civilian-led government of Prime Minister Hamdak and to urge General Burhan and others to continue um, supporting a transition to a civilian government. A subsequent coup and then a very difficult period of negotiations has left us uh, in a place of real, I think, difficulty and desperation. Uh, we cannot allow the civilian leadership of the, the groups that led the brave uprising that overthrew Omar al-Bashir um, to be shoved aside. And I appreciate Under Secretary your early comment that we need a broader process and we need to implement the President's executive order. Um, help me understand how we will do both of these. How do we engage um, the civilian leadership and empower them in the next step of this process? And would you welcome legislative action here to give you more tools to target individual sanctions? I respect that the administration took tough actions in terms of suspending bilateral aid, suspending debt relief, and I think that had real impact um, on leaders. But um, there are critics who say that in the absence of targeted individual sanctions, there's the continuation of a sense of impunity that in some ways came from Omar al-Bashir never being successfully prosecuted by the ICC and decades of uh, widespread corruption and oppression. So I introduced the Sudan Democracy Act last year to reflect the urgent need to hold these military leaders accountable. Would you support legislation at this point or welcome additional support for sanctions? And how do we broaden this process? Senator Coons, let me first start by thanking you for your indefatigable personal diplomacy on our hardest challenges in Africa, including your willingness with Senator Van Hollen to roll up your sleeves and, and get to Sudan and talk to the generals. Um, it makes a difference, and uh, we appreciate the partnership that we have uh, on that. Um, let me say that... Uh, We've got to get to a situation where we can engage the civilians again. Um, can we do that? Do we have to wait till we can do that from Khartoum? Can we begin assuming we can do the most urgent, which is get the humanitarian aid in and silence or lessen the guns? Can we start to do that in a a uh, more 21st century way with video meetings, et cetera. I think that remains to be seen. I do know, as I said at the beginning, that Ambassador Godfrey is trying to cast, even as he works the talks in Jeddah, as wide a net, take sounding, see what people are wanting. This has to be a process that is broadly representative of the desires of the people of Sudan and the um, 2019 Revolution, but we welcome thoughts you have there. We are beginning. We are doing the work. We had done it um, already, but now that we have the executive order, we're doing the work to look at appropriate targets in various categories. Particularly, if we cannot get these these generals to uh, allow the humanitarian aid in and and put their guns down. Um, I, with regard to legislation, let me um, get a little bit more information from our negotiators after this round is over and come back to you if we may. We'll, we'll look forward to prompt input. Thank you. Um, and I do think, um, I understand in this moment, um, focusing on the commanders of these two armed forces that are battling it out literally in the streets yeah. of Khartoum, but we have to be able to find a way to include in this conversation, not just regional actors, but the Sudanese people themselves and their legitimate leaders, if I might, because I have just a few moments, assistance to the Administrator Charles. Do you have the resources you need? I'm concerned about the looting um, of humanitarian um, storehouses, about the deaths of humanitarian workers. Um, many of your partners, our partners, are still willing to take on this very uh, difficult and dangerous duty. What additional resources and support do you need 
And are we doing enough to ask our regional and global partners to also be engaged, given the scale of the humanitarian need in other crises around the region and the world? many competing needs right now around the globe and our ability to sustain a robust response in Sudan is gonna be very challenged. Even before this crisis, last year we knew that Sudan was one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to Russia's war in Ukraine because of how dependent it was on wheat imports. And so we'd already tried to scale up our assistance in Sudan and it was already gonna be hard to sustain that this year given competing demands. So we're definitely pressing other donors. We were pleased to see the Saudis announce $100 million last week, but we wanna see that delivered to partners that can actually deliver on the ground. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to touch on something that's been quite disturbing to me. Um, on January 20th of 21, this administration was presented with a great opportunity. Uh, Sudan had just become party to the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords presented an opportunity to develop the economy of Sudan in a new way. Uh, there was an opportunity there to expand the economic opportunities for the people of Sudan and to stabilize the region. But for months, uh, the Biden administration would not even refer to the term or use the term Abraham Accords. Um, on May of 2021, May 18th of 2021, then White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki demonstrated the contempt that the White House had for the Abraham Accords when she told reporters the following, and I want to quote this, aside from putting together a peace proposal that was dead on arrival, we don't think they, meaning the prior administration, did anything constructive to really bring an end to the longstanding conflict in the Middle East. So that's why I sent President Biden a letter on May 19th of 2021, and I asked him to confirm whether we even supported the Abraham Accords. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to present this letter for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What's worse, though, is that we recently saw China advance what I would call an anti-Abraham Accords deal when you had the chief diplomat of China negotiate a deal in the Middle East between Saudi Arabia and its adversary, Iran. What I would have much preferred to have seen happen would have been to see our own Secretary of State negotiating a deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel, uh, furthering the Abraham Accords. I think we've missed a huge opportunity. But let's turn to the American citizens in Sudan right now. Um, so far, Ambassador Newland, at least two American citizens have already been killed. The intelligence community assesses that the conflict is likely to be protracted, and they're saying little prospect for negotiation. Senator Cardin and I just sent a private letter to Secretary Blinken urging the department to take all necessary steps to protect the lives of U.S. persons that remain in Sudan, particularly as the security situation deteriorates. I'd like to go back to the conversation you had with Senator Ricketts just a minute ago. When I served as U.S. Ambassador to Japan, I understood very clearly the State Department's foremost responsibility is the safety and security of the American citizens in, in the nation. Where I was serving, and as ambassador there, I worked very closely with both civilian and military leaders to revise and update the plan that I needed to be in a position to evacuate over 60,000 American citizens should that need arise. So, Secretary Newland, under what conditions would the Biden administration implement the civilian evacuation plan, the non-combatant evacuation operational plan uh, in Sudan to bring the remaining American citizens that are home in Sudan? Senator Haggerty, uh, just to, we, we did talk about this a little bit before uh, you were able to join us. We had in total uh, 5,000 Americans registered with the embassy. We were able throughout this conflict to push repeated messages to them, uh, requesting information about who wanted to leave. About half of them left on Allied aircraft, the other half left on who wanted to go, some 1,300 total, uh, left on ground transport that we organized. Um, we are in touch on a weekly basis, daily basis, with those who remain for a variety of reasons that you know well, mixed families, um, yes. lives built in Sudan. And I heard that conversation yeah. with Sec Senator Ricketts, but I, what I'm asking specifically is that communication, is this process part of the NEO plan that's yes. been designed? Yes. And you have a NEO plan in place? Of course. And 
are you prepared to exercise that plan further? And are you, do you have the resources and the necessary capabilities to do that if it's necessary to go in and get the remaining American citizens out who want, again, who, as you say, desire to leave? Um, as we evaluate the options for Americans, and we are continuing to get out Americans who want to go, if there is a critical mass, we will evaluate whether we need to do more. I think it's just absolutely critical that we be prepared to execute this. After seeing what happened in Afghanistan, I think the American public was shocked. We don't want to see another failure like this. And I think we're hearing, my office is hearing a great deal of concern about the American citizens that are left behind. Thank I would, you. I would also, Senator, invite you, if you have particular uh, Americans you're concerned about, please send them our way and we will work with them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Madam Undersecretary. Great to see you, and um, it's great to have you and our key representatives from AID here today. And thank you for your efforts, uh, both to provide uh, much-needed humanitarian assistance uh, as well as try to uh, make the ceasefire hold so we can, we can build on that. Um, and I do want to start by uh, thanking uh, you and your colleagues at the State Department, um, Assistant Secretary Molly Fee, as well as the folks at the Consular Affairs uh, Divisions uh, for helping get Americans out who wanted to get out, um, including every Marylander who has contacted our office uh, who wanted uh, to uh, exit Sudan or have their relatives uh, get out of Sudan, including uh, an 89-year-old uh, who escaped through the Egyptian border. Uh, crossing. So I want to thank you because everyone we've heard from um, has uh, been listened to and had their uh, their needs needs met. Um, let me let me um, just turn to the current state of the, the peace. The, well, the the ceasefire negotiations. If you could talk a little bit more about the role of the UAE and Saudi Arabia here, um, I understand that. Senator Coons referenced a trip that we took uh, to Sudan in 2021, where we met with many of these. Uh, players. Uh, I know there'll be more time to evaluate this as we go forward, but um, my takeaway from that trip, which we shared from shared with folks at the State Department, is that um, we, we probably should have made a choice then uh, to isolate uh, Hamedi. That's my view. Uh, he's a war criminal. We know about his history uh, in Darfur. Uh, and the fact that he was able to continue to, you know, assemble his power base uh, in Sudan, which was already considerable, uh, I think has uh, contributed to the situation we're here now. Not that that would have been easy. Um, it would have been hard. Uh, but uh, I think we've, we've seen what happened uh, when he continued to play the, the role he has. But can you talk about uh, the way forward? And then uh, if you could also uh, address the, the potential challenges um, in neighboring Ethiopia. I mean, we have a very fragile peace uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, obviously, there are some territorial disputes between Sudan and, and Ethiopia, uh, and uh, I, we need to be doing everything we can to make sure that the conflict in Sudan doesn't make the situation even worse in Ethiopia. So if you could address those questions. First, Senator Van Holland, um, it's great to hear that the consular system worked for your constituent, constituents and Marylanders. Um, very good to hear. We welcome any... Um, improvements, comments that you have about that system going forward or any of the other members of this committee. Um, and second, you missed our shout out to your diplomacy along with uh, Senator Coons, which really made a big difference, your willingness to roll up your sleeves and, and talk to these difficult, difficult actors. Um, so in this particular round in Jeddah, uh, first of all, the uh, Saudis are acting as hosts and have been instrumental to getting conversation at least going between these warring parties. Uh, without that, it might not have happened at all. I will say that although, as you know better than many, uh, the regional players, including the UAE, have their own economic interests and long-term ties to various parts of this, uh, the UA has been very constructive in this effort to get parties to Jeddah, to get the guns stopped, and to get these humanitarian routes going. Um, we And they have actually been pressuring both sides and sending uh, strong messages. So we look forward to uh, to that continuing uh, going forward and to staying in, in because it's going to take everybody to press on everybody. 
Uh, with regard to Ethiopia, I think you talked to Secretary Blinken after he came back um, from his trip, and we have had progress, as you know, uh, implementing key elements of the November cessation of hostilities agreement, the COA, including uh, formation of the Tigray Interim Regional Administration, withdrawal of Eritrean forces, uh, and concurrent DPLF disarmament, the positive role that the African Union's monitoring mission is playing. And I will say, back on Sudan, we are working with the African Union on what we hope will be a large support and convening um, function that they will play if we can get to these larger talks that we talked about. Um, these initial elements are beginning to show, to bear fruit. Uh, obviously, we've got continuing difficulties with some parts of Sudan, We're, uh, with uh, Ethiopia. We've got to um, ensure that the government of Ethiopia continues to fulfill its commitment for unhindered access to humanitarian actors, for accountability, that it continues to meet its commitment for real justice, that journalists have safe access, that we continue to see good conversations um, uh, with other constituent parts of Ethiopia, and that's what we're working on, and we appreciate your support for all of that. Thank you. I hope we can, um, look, I think we're all incredibly disappointed that the hopes for democracy in Sudan have been hijacked here, and uh, I know we all share the goal of trying to get it back on track, but we should look at some of the lessons learned for, for why it didn't happen uh, the way we wanted the first time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for, to both of the witnesses for being here today. And Ms. Charles, good to see you from South Carolina. I wish it was under different circumstances, but certainly always happy to see a South Carolinian representing our nation. It's been nearly a month since the outbreak of the hostilities in Sudan. Since then, we've seen ceasefire after ceasefire fail. Hundreds of thousands have fled their homes. Nearly 600 have been killed, 5,000 injured, figures that are likely underrepresented. Hospitals have been attacked, medical care is scarce, access to food and water is quickly running out, and a country plagued with sectarian strife and human, oh, sorry, humanitarian crisis, the situation seems to be only getting worse. All of this is the direct result of two selfish men and their desire to keep power, really, at all costs, it seems to me, at the expense of their own people, propped up by, in part, the inadequacy of the U.S. policy. Apart from the loss of civilian lives, I'm greatly concerned about the risk that further instability in Sudan can cause to regions beyond it. I'll start with the easy question, Ms. Newland. How did we get where we are and how do we bring the conflict to an end, particularly not with one strong man, but two strong men who overthrew the powers that were? Thank you, Senator Scott. Um, without going back through decades of tragic history in Sudan, I will start with where we were uh, after uh, Hamdok was ousted and our efforts with our international partners to support the Sudanese people in creating a larger process that included more Sudanese civil society, more of their uh, civilian voices in this framework arrangement for a transition, which was uh, painfully negotiated among them, and then months and months of effort, which was, we felt, uh, bearing real fruit to get to that democratic transition, particularly in the fall and throughout the winter. We were, as I said earlier in this hearing, down to literally one issue, the one that you identified, whether these two generals would agree to unify their forces. Uh, and we were in the process of offering various options for how that could happen along with our international partners. We were concerned because tensions between, between them would flare on and off. Um, and uh, then we had the very disappointing choice on April 15th for them to pick up their guns rather than continue with the talks, and that's how we got where we are. What are we doing now? We are, first and foremost, 
focused on trying to get them to put those guns down, down long enough and well enough so that uh, um, Assistant Secretary Charles and colleagues can get serious humanitarian aid in. We are now on our sixth, seventh short-term ceasefire, uh, which yeah. is a direct result of the international pressure that everybody's putting on them, including more than 12 phone calls to the parties by Secretary Blinken himself. So what we're trying to get done in Jeddah now uh, is to negotiate a declaration of commitment to protect the civilians of Sudan that would be um, agreed by both of the warring parties to open corridors and follow humanitarian principles on the ground in Sudan. That's stage one. Stage two would then be to try to make this ceasefire enduring. And stage three would be to get back to a civilian-led process, probably with a broader um, contingent of civilians involved than we had the last time. It is uh, extremely difficult, as you noted. Yes, ma'am. Quick, quick, quick thought, thought on evacuation plans for Americans and the challenges that we seem to face. I'd say if you look at the uh, fact that France was able to evacuate 500 people in the first 48 hours, Germany about 700 people, China about 2,000, all before the U.S. even started to support the evacuation efforts of American citizens. My thought is, why? And second is, as I think about the South Carolinians in Khartoum who've been calling my office asking for assistance, there seems to be no actual plan that they've received from the State Department, so I'd love to hear uh, what, what happens next and how do we do a better job of helping our American citizens who want to leave. I think your microphone went off, ma'am. Uh, after the initial evacuation of the embassy, yes, um, we were able to support our allies in establishing a beachhead at the airport. More than half of the Americans who got out, as we've determined through the math at this hearing, we got 1,300 Americans out altogether. More than half of them went on those allied flights in the first few days. While we were working in a division of labor, if you will, on the land routes, which were, we were able to get another 700 people out through the land routes, including some of our allies in exchange. Um, we are continuing to give advice uh, to the, any remaining Americans. You know, sometimes at the beginning of an evacuation, people aren't ready or they are not sure about their family circumstances. So we have uh, continuing advice to other, uh, to Americans who want to come out now. If you have uh, constituents, please send them to us Thank and you. we will work on it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Booker. Um, thanks to both the witnesses and, and thanks to the chairman for holding a full committee on this. I, I've obviously uh, gathered a lot from listening to my colleagues. I, I just want to, obviously there's multiple fronts to this effort on our, uh, in terms of America. Uh, one is we've heard a lot about getting American citizens out. I've talked to Jake Sullivan and others and been working with offices. Another front is obviously is trying to cease hostilities and these pre-negotiations in Jeddah are, are, are so critical. And then finally, helping civil society, which was talked about extensively, and finding a way not only to deal with the current crises that are going on, threatening civilians, displaced internal persons, people fleeing to other unstable, unstable countries like Chad and Ethiopia are a crisis. And and the, the, this is a day-to-day -day changing. The reports I'm trying to stay up with from the Congressional Research Service and more, I, I wanna drill down on a, on a couple themes within those three areas I talked about. The first is the still challenging bureaucracy of getting aid into the country, which is really frustrating when you think about things being held up, held up at the port of Sudan, uh, uh, critical supplies, who are the controlling government entities on the ground right now, um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the Humanitarian Aid Commission and more, and then is there an opportunity to more center civilians in this larger negotiations that are going on, because clearly in Jeddah, the two parties are the warring generals, but the desire here is for civilian society um, uh, to begin to be elevated uh, and the democratic governance uh, um, uh, to be empowered for the future as well. 
Sure. I, um, on a personal note, early in my career, I helped start up the Darfur response for one of our humanitarian partners nearly 20 years ago. So I've been dealing with the hack, the Humanitarian Affairs Commission in Sudan, off and on for almost two decades now. And their behavior is egregious, even under the best of circumstances, and particularly now. So we've been pressing both in the in the discussions in Jeddah, but also in bilateral um, conversations, including um, with the embassy here and others, on the need to lift those bureaucratic restrictions. It's it's egregious to have goods held up in customs and clearance processes in Port Sudan, or have our partners feel like they have to go to the hack for permission to to draw on prepositioned supplies. Um, so we're actively working those issues, and they continue to be a, a top priority. We have seen some of the food that we were bringing into Port Sudan just cleared in the last couple of days. So seeing some small progress there, but it's something that we're certainly staying very much on top of. And just to say that the humanitarian declaration of commitment to protect civilians in Sudan that we're working on in Jeddah embeds in it the, some of these basic humanitarian principles um, that have undergirded the work Assistant Secretary Charles has done her whole life, but that the Sudanese actors need to enforce. So we'll see how that um, concludes. With regard to where we go on broadening that initial framework, I think we agree completely that it's going to have to be broader. I will say, um, and I think you've been involved in this some as well, that we have not limited our own engagement in terms of how to move the transition forward just to those who are participant in the framework. Ambassador Godfrey has really um, broadened uh, our outreach to the NGO community, to different aspects of civil society. The secretary's had um, some of those folks into his office. I had a group of civil society folks in my office. I think the question's gonna be when we, uh, if we have that good news that we get beyond put down the guns, get a ceasefire, get the food in to get back to framework. I think the question is going to be how to structure it so it's sufficiently broad to capture the various uh, views and ideas, but not so broad that it becomes unwieldy, right? Right. And, and so obviously this is a colossal uh, uh, breakdown here, a failure in a sense of democracy to take root. And it means that we have to reevaluate all of our actions and roles that we've played and try things differently. And I know those conversations are going on. I know that we see vulnerable citizens, there's, you know, armed militias have once again targeted uh, refugees in Darfur. There, there are so many crises and, and fronts to this. I wanna uh, uh, just get, in the last seconds I have, a little bit more input from you because I know that you are, uh, my understanding at least is to, that you are the chair of a working group on, uh, on Wagner in, in uh, overall. And so, uh, I mean, clearly, there are operations going on uh, there, a large percentage, around 70% of the gold that's being exported is going to Russia. We know what's going on on the ground. I wonder if in, in the final seconds, can you give me some insights um, into the Wagner Group and how are we uh, countering uh, uh, what's going on in their really destabilizing efforts in the region? As you know, Senator Booker, and as you said, Wagner plays a malign role no matter where it shows up. And in Africa, whether it is in Sudan, whether it is in Central African Republic, whether it is across the Sahel, it has brought uh, nothing but more violence, um, a looting of the sovereignty and the wealth of these countries. And we are working with multiple countries across Africa to help them, many of whom have buyer's remorse now that they invited Wagner in at all. Um, and we can talk to you in a um, more secure setting on some of our efforts there, everything from countering disinformation to um, uh, offering better options in terms of security, et cetera, to uh, disrupting the supply chain of uh, Wagner weapons in and gold and other things out. Uh, we are working intensively also with other partners in the gold supply chain, uh, including UAE, on these on these problems. But you are absolutely right. Prigozhin has brought nothing good to Sudan, and he's strip mining the country of its gold and its future. And my, my time's expired. I just want to say, first of all, I want to take either you and knowing how many demands on their time up, someone uh, on sitting in a classified setting having this conversation, because the scope of the Wagner's operations, I just saw Facebook shutting down 
100, 100 plus accounts. They are working on so many different fronts in the African uh, venue context that is so disturbing. And, I, and I'd like to better understand our efforts to uh, counter uh, their uh, uh, malign activities. Good, we'll look forward to that. Thank you. Um, let me ask you some final questions. I know that the May 4th executive order on Sudan issued by the president, but there was also an executive order issued related to the conflict in Ethiopia that was never fully utilized. Not a single Ethiopian was designated under the executive order even though 800,000 people are estimated to have died as a result of the conflict in northern Ethiopia. So sanctions are only effective if used as part of a well-thought-out strategy to obtain specific policy goals and aims. Does the administration have a strategy to use targeted sanctions to obtain the outcomes we are seeking? Will we use targeted sanctions to pressure the parties in Jeddah to come to an agreement? Uh, Chairman, I think you've seen around the world the administration's commitment to using sanctions, including on a subject that we work on a lot together, the uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. I would argue that the fact of the ex executive order on May 4th that we gave ourselves this tool was um, had an effect on the parties being willing to come to Jeddah. As I said, we are working on how that executive order could be populated with names depending upon how the talks go. We have done the same in Ethiopia and I would argue that ha just having the executive order played a, a good role in getting us to the better place we are Are there in packages de deployed, I mean are packages uh, that are ready to be deployed if you make that decision? There are, there okay. are. Well, uh, do we have any diplomatic outreach to allies and partners to join us in imposing sanctions if we, in fact, uh, decide to do so? Yes, the Secretary and Assistant Secretary Fee and, and I have all been involved in ensuring that if we go in that direction, we don't go there alone. Uh, now, I want to refer back to uh, Senator Risch's uh, remarks about a special envoy for Sudan. And that, that call has a uh, growing chorus of voices. Our current special envoy for the Horn of Africa, unlike his predecessors, does not cover Sudan, uh, nor does he directly report to the president or the secretary of state. What's the administration's position on a special envoy that reports directly to the president or secretary of state? Chairman, at the, at the current moment, uh, particularly since he is now outside Sudan and not running a massive embassy, uh, we are deploying Ambassador Godfrey not just to maintain broad contacts with Sudanese and participate in these talks in Jeddah and any onward talks. We also anticipate using him to maintain tight links to regional partners to the global coalition we will need on this. Uh, including working uh, intensively now with the African Union, although having Steph Sullivan confirm would be even um, augmenting of that. There are pieces of this Sudan work that Mike Hammer, our Ethiopia envoy, has been helpful in, um, and he will continue to be helpful, and we will call on him. So in, other, in other words, you don't support, the, the department does not support a special envoy. As I hear all your answers there are around the edges, but not onto my question. On, at, at the moment, we see... Uh, we see Ambassador Godfrey as that envoy, he, but... Is he really going to do all the shuttle diplomacy that you're talking he, about? He, he will if we need to, and, yeah. And, and, of course, he reports to what, Molly Fee? He does. Yeah. So it just seems to many of us uh, that, given the stakes in the region, that we urgently need a high-level representative to deal with interlocutors uh, in Africa, the Gulf, in Europe, and one who reports directly to the President or the Secretary of State. Um, and I, I, while you're here, please take that back to the Department. I intend to press it at, uh, at various different levels, but I think it's incredibly I important. I want to concur in that. And, and Senator Risch is uh, joining uh, uh, me in that regard. He raised it originally. So, uh, Finally, uh, Ms. Charles, I, I've heard some of your answers. Uh, 
Secretary General Gutierrez at the UN said in mid-April that the humanitarian situation in Sudan was already precarious, now a catastrophe. Uh, I hear that you've set up a DART team in Nairobi. But if a five-day humanitarian ceasefire is agreed, are organizations ready to move into assistance to Sudan and deliver it um, to the conflict-affected uh, areas? Our partners are already gearing up, and in fact, many are trying to send more staff into Sudan right now, which is part of the reason why we're pressing on things like waivers of, of visas. Um, they're also bringing supplies into Port Sudan. The key is really to have sufficient security to move those supplies from Port Sudan, and then to distribute them where they're most most needed, both inside of Khartoum and Darfur, Northern Kordofan, where we're seeing And And, the and what, what does that security entail? Who, who would provide it? Well, it's, it's really having the assurances from the parties that they will respect that now, access. So now, given the urgency of the situation, what happens if we don't get this humanitarian ceasefire? Is there any way to deliver humanitarian assistance in Sudan if talks in Jeddah fail? So even right now, we're working with our partners to very quickly use what is already in Sudan and also pursue all available routes, um, including from neighboring countries, to bring supplies in to try and diversify where supplies would be coming in from, not be so reliant on, on just a Port Sudan to Khartoum route. Let me ask you, but the, the Sudan humanitarian response was already severely underfunded. It just received about 14% of the required funding before the current crisis. So what actions are we undertaking to galvanize financial contributions from international partners in order to be able to meet the challenge, assuming that we have the wherewithal to do so? Yes. Um, it was already underfunded. We were funding the majority of that humanitarian response plan. We've been pleased to see the Saudis make an announcement of a $100 million pledge. We want to see that actually delivered to actors on the ground who can responsibly um, uh, deliver that assistance. Um, we're certainly pressing others. We've seen indications from the Canadians, um, from the European Union as well, that they'll put support behind this. But we've, we've really seen, particularly from the Gulf, I will say, um, a stepping away from humanitarian assistance, and particularly in their neighborhood, we would love to see them step up in a more... Now, many of the international uh, staff of aid organizations evacuated Khartoum. Uh, so uh, we may not be able to, even if the opportunity, the window gets open, to rely upon our traditional partners to reach beneficiaries. Are we supporting Sudanese organizations that may be able to, have, have, in, in fact, given the opportunity, be able to do that? Yes. So among our partners are 30 Sudanese um, local NGOs that are either direct or, or more often indirect partners of ours. We've been in close contact with them, not just our international partners. Um, even our international partners, um, most of their Sudanese staff um, are still in country, albeit many of them have relocated to other areas and they're reconstituting. Um, and we're working with them, again, to kind of reconstitute as quickly as possible and get them the resources they need. One of the consequences, this is always true, this is true in the Western Hemisphere as it is in Sudan, that if we cannot come to a successful conclusion here, up to a million Sudanese may very well be on the move and seek refuge. Uh, that already has a growing reality on the borders of Egypt. Uh, what, what, is your, what is your assessment of Egypt's willingness and capacity to process a large number of refugees over its border with Sudan? Do you want to take that one? I, I can let Undersecretary Newland speak more generally about uh, uh, Egypt. Yeah, I really thought it was her... It was her uh, her ballywick, so there to speak, go. but I'm, I'm, if you have insights, I'm happy to hear that too. So. Do you want to start and I'll do them broader? Yeah. I can say we've, we've certainly been pressing with uh, colleagues at the State Department for the Egyptians to allow um, uh, international organizations, particularly UNHCR and IOM, to the border. Those, those missions moved for the first time just four or five days ago, so we've seen some progress on that front. Um, we'd also like to see the opening of, of kind of a land route from Ethiopia into Sudan so that we can address conditions on the Sudanese side of that border as well. So just to complement that, um, we have about 70,000 Sudanese who've already, and third country nationals who've already arrived in Egypt. Um, Egypt, as you know, is not the richest country on the planet, so 
looking at um, how to encourage support there and international support for, for Egypt. We're also talking to Chad, uh, who is beginning to see its own um, stream of refugees and to ensure that uh, the Egyptian Red Crescent on the border is doing as much as it can, that the crossing points are open and uh, easy to maneuver. As um, uh, Assistant Secretary Charles just said, the, the first problem was getting UN and, and IO humanitarian access to the border. That's now happened, so it's something that we're watching and working on. Well, I mean, this is a, a challenge of conflict. We see it in the Western Hemisphere. We have 20 million people who are displaced in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, or they're seeking refugee status, or they're seeking asylum, or they're just simply displaced. Uh, and if they cannot be assimilated in the countries that they have moved to, then they will march north. In this case, they will march elsewhere. And so thinking about that in advance as a reality, a, a real possibility, hopefully not a reality, is going to be critical. Otherwise, we will then again deal with the aftermath and not be prepared for the aftermath instead of thinking uh, about it proactively. I, I urge you both to, to look at that. Uh, let me thank both of our witnesses for appearing before the committee to discuss the crisis in Sudan. It's obviously an extremely volatile situation. We urgently need to use all available tools to put an end to the fighting, chart a new path forward towards a civilian-led democracy. Uh, given how rapidly events are changing on the ground, uh, I uh, urge both of your um, departments uh, and agencies to continue to keep the committee apprised uh, of your actions. The record of the hearing will remain open until the close of business on Friday, May the 12th. Please ensure that questions for the record are submitted no later than that date, and let's hope that we can get an expeditious response to them. With that, the hearing is adjourned.